Welcome back to the Paddle and Fin Podcast Network. We're brought to you by Pelican Built Tough. For all situations, go to pelican.com. Yak Gadget. For all your fine kayak fishing accessory needs, go to yakgadget.com. Eastport Marina on the beautiful shores of Dale Hollow Lake. For all your lodging, kayaking, and fishing needs, go to eastport.info. Now let's get this show started. Welcome back, everyone. Another episode of Feather and Fur, your host, Brad Hurlbus. And today we have Aaron with the Quacks and Quivers YouTube channel. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brad. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's always fun to get on another Wisconsin hunter, someone that's doing the YouTube game, which I don't play with at all because I don't have the time or the patience to edit video. Like the most you'll ever see out of me is a 10 second reel because that's about all my attention span is because it's squirrel and I'm off to something else. So... <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm excited to have you on. Um, I like to start my shows the same way, so we'll just stick with that format because it works. How'd you get into hunting? Was it a long time thing with your family, or did you kind of take it up on your own? Yeah, so I uh, actually started off on my mom's side. My right. grandpa and my uncle they got land up in Superior, Wisconsin. Um, so it just kind of started when I was younger, just rabbit hunting, squirrel hunting, deer hunting, and then it just kind of progressed into me like channeling my own route through hunting and discovering duck hunting and start doing that, start doing like goose hunting, get more in depth into deer hunting. Uh, and it just kind of branched off from that and just started a, a spiral of anything outdoors that I could do. Sure. That's the way it kind of seems to work. I took it up on myself and I started with waterfowl, but that led into everything else. And then that led to me loving the dog work, which drug me into upland hunting. And that's where I spend most of my time now, but I mean, growing up with a family, I mean, so up in Superior, I'm assuming, did you do like deer camp then? Because I mean, that's a hike from Southern Wisconsin. That's not a small drive. So for deer season, like, did you guys have the full on deer camp then? Uh, Sort of. So my, my uh, grandpa and half of my mom's side live permanently up in Superior. Uh, so we just stay at their house and they just got land behind their house. Um, but yeah, it almost felt as if it was a deer camp, even though it was their house. I mean, everyone was everything was blaze orange. Everybody had deer photos out, um, rifles all over ATVs running trucks running. And it's, it's always more of like, uh, because it is Thanksgiving as well for here in Wisconsin, you know, it's, it's more than just deer hunting. I mean, Thanksgiving, you get to sit around, hang out with your family, tell stories and stories just, you know, I, I listen to my grandpa and he'll just talk about stories forever about, you know, how when he was younger and how much it's changed over the years of not only the public land, but private land hunting and how it's adapted with the internet and everything today. Sure. It's a completely different world out there. I mean, I mean, from Onyx and Google Maps and satellite photography and just the knowledge that's out there just for publicly available for a lot of it's free. I mean, you can use a lot of county GIS websites and state websites to look at public lands. Now you don't have to pay for Onyx, but paying for Onyx opens up just a super simple application just to like look up landowner's name or to find all the public land. I mean, when I first got started in this, my I had printed maps from wardens showing me like where the private land open to public hunting was because there just wasn't good tools on the internet yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy what you can do with it. And I guess I use it every year. Uh, definitely when it comes to like goose hunting and getting permission for private fields, it just makes it easier. You're just able to click on a field, see who owns it, see where they're located. And, you know, if you got any good luck, you can hopefully win over the field and get on a good goose hunt. But I mean, not only that, it's, they have so many different applications where it comes to like, if you're tracking a deer, you can start a track in the woods and then it'll just pick up where you go and it'll just follow you and it'll mark your whole track route out. So you, you lose blood, you can get back on it, see where you last saw blood and mark tree stands, trail cams, where you saw deer. There's, there's so many different applications for it. It's crazy what you can do with today's world. Oh, I agree completely. I haven't, I'm still old school when it comes to tracking deer. Like I haven't used Onyx for that yet. Like I'm still like little pieces of toilet paper or something like that, that like, will like, <laughs> disintegrate and rain still um 
I've been pretty lucky the last three deer I've shot. Neither one's gone more than like 50 yards. Like I haven't really had to track anything. It's just been like, oh, there it is. So I've gotten pretty lucky there, but I also haven't been archery hunting at all. I've just, I've kind of skipped over archery season to focus on birds. So I, I just gun hunt now and I just use large bore rifles that make big blood trails. Yeah. It's always a plus. It's, <laughs> it's always nervous using a bow. You know, I mean, you can, you can practice however many times you want, but there's so much more error when it comes to a bow than there is a rifle. And it's, but it's, it's a thrill that, you know, it's something I can only get from hunting whitetails with a bow. It is a completely different experience than hunting with a gun. Agreed. One, I mean, it's a different time of year to begin with, and there's far more anticipation. Like, at least normally, like for us around here for gun season, the rut's pretty much over. Maybe on a really early year, you might get a little tail end of chasing, but that's still pretty much done. I mean, that's Halloween weekend, first week in, a November, first week in November. Is like At least in my areas where it's always been historically peak activity for the rut. And when you're out there with bow and you've got, I mean, the last time I was out there with my bow, I mean, I've got this doe just head down, just walking in front of me, sniffing in this big box right behind her and keeps looking at me. And then right back to the doe. And the doe has no idea I'm there. And this buck like takes three steps, looks at me again. The buck knows for sure I'm there, but he's so focused on the doe, he won't run. He won't leave the doe. And the doe doesn't know I'm there. So they, yeah. they walk right in front of me and I screwed up. I rushed the shot. I missed. And I'm like, oh, that's like the biggest buck I've ever had a chance at too. I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's so just- kind. They really... They really just completely let their guard down. Definitely if they're trailing a hot doe or with a doe, they they usually won't leave that doe side. And in my head, like, and that's an experience for me because I'm not I'm not a huge archery hunter. It's nothing I've I have i have done it for a few years now, and it's something it's not a big focus of mine. Cause like I said, in October, I'm normally up north chasing grouse with my dog. So I had more time. Like even with like with duck hunting, we always say like you have more time than you think, right? Like you call the shot, like everybody's like, oh, let's shoot right when you got you got enough time to get your gun shoulder, pick out a bird. I mean, it, you can slow things down and still have birds plenty within range. And I didn't even take that whole mentality or any of those lessons with me. I'm just like, I gotta shoot this thing right now because the the doe's gonna see me, and, and I had way more time than what I thought. Yeah, yeah, it's always a struggle though. I mean, you're trying to, and I mean, they can hear like none other too, you know, if your shoulder brushes up against the tree or you drag your bowstring across your arm or even on the cam locks, like, you know, sometimes those things are kind of loud and they can hear you and it's, you got so many different emotions and adrenaline going and it's crazy. I agree, but it's, it's a, it's a fun kind of crazy. It, it is. It, it also drives you nuts too. At least it drove me nuts. Cause like you get big bucks on your camera and you feel like you got them patterned and then like you pick the stand, which you think is right for the wind. And you really have, you really don't see much during that day. And then you go out and you like swap your trail camera. I'd swap my trail camera cars before I leave. And all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, I would have just sat in this stand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, <laughs> at the end of the day, they're wild animals and mother nature is crazy. So you can, you can have as many ducks in a row as you want, but sometimes you're still just rolling the dice at the end of the, the end of the day. You know, I mean, a buck can, decide whichever way he wants to end his pattern and go a different way out of his bedding area. But you've been watching him go, let's say he goes south every day for the last four days. And then that one day you sit there, wind could be perfect. And he decides to go north. Right. You just never know. <laughs> it's kind of the fun of it though. Kind of the fun of it. So did you start archery hunting then? Did you take that up on your own? Cause I know you're going up to superior for, for gun season. Did you also start heading up there? Or do you start, are you chasing those? Are you chasing with archery around the public land here? Yeah, so I, I actually started, oh, let's think, I've, I've always shot a bow just for fun uh, when I was younger, but then I really got into archery hunting, I think around 18. Um, I went out, bought a nice compound, started practicing with it, started doing some more research on it, and I pretty much took a whole year on a piece of public land, it was like 1,200 acres in Waukesha County. Um, and I like took just that property and I just tore it all apart. I took everything I knew, everything I could get off YouTube or Google or talking to guys who've been hunting that property for a while. And I actually was, ended up being successful on November 7th. I shot my first buck with a bow and it was, it had to be 
for like 10 minutes after shoot and light. It was like first thing in the morning, super crunchy and all the leaves were freezing cold. So you could hear the thing coming from a couple hundred yards. And I was sitting there and I'm just shaking in the stand before the thing even showed up. And I, could, I knew it was coming right at me. The wind was perfect. And I was able to make a, it was like 12 yard shot on the thing and it ran like 75 yards. So I was, I was happy that I, I got a double lung. So I was happy I was able to harvest that animal without it really running too far. And it was just a quick lethal kill. So that's always, always makes it easier. But yeah, it was, that kind of hooked me right there with archery hunting. It was, it was crazy. Sure. I mean, I've never experienced, I've never experienced the deer coming from that far away. Like where I hunt, it's kind of swampy and you get a good freeze, but still like in that swamp mud, they can stay pretty quiet. Like, I mean, I don't know how deer stay as quiet as they do, but to have that coming from hundreds of yards away and you can just hear every crunch by the time it got there, like it had to have felt like an eternity. Oh, it did. And it, and it was super overcast too. So it was super dark in the morning and I, I ended up hearing the thing and I was like, the thing's got to be right here. And I was hunting on the edge of this thicket and that thicket was like, I don't know, I had to be. 15 20 yards from the edge of my stand and you know i could hear it coming and i just could not see the thing and i'm like it's got to be right in front of me you know and yeah sure enough next thing you know like 20 yards away i see just this rat coming through and i drew on it and it stepped out and the first two steps it took out of that thicket i was able to stop it and get a good shot on it that's perfect that's perfect so that was your first one. Is that the biggest one then? Is that, is that still your biggest buck to date? Have you been able to go find something a little bigger? Or? Yeah. So two years ago now, I uh, I actually ended up bull hunting this property that my buddy actually get got in uh, Brookfield. And I lived in Brookfield at the time. And there's some pretty big bucks out there. And luckily enough, he was able to let me hunt it and I kind of did the same thing with that property. I kind of tore it all apart, checked everything out, was trying to figure out where bedding was and where the deer were trafficking through. And they, it had a decent amount of water in the property as well. So they were bedding kind of close to the water. Um, and there was pressure around, but I was limited. And that was the only thing I didn't like because I only had that 40 some acre plot. And it's like, yeah, it's private. But at the same time, I was like, you know, if a, a buck was bedding just outside the property. There's nothing I could do about it. Right. Um, so that kind of got frustrating. And it's, it was funny because I actually patterned a couple bucks and there's this one 12 pointer that I patterned like almost down to the minute. And it was a, a Thursday and it was like, it was a week into bow season, I think. Um, so just end of September, bugs are still screaming, mosquitoes everywhere, still warm temperatures. I was wearing like a, just a long sleeve shirt and I went right after work. I was like, you know what? The wind's perfect. Like this is when it it's coming around, weather's dropping a little bit. So I hurried up, got out of work, went over there and I actually ended up shooting a buck that I've never even had on camera. And I thought it was that buck I had on camera. Uh, but it, this one's got split brow tines and the one I was getting on camera didn't. And I ended up shooting him at 10 yards and he dropped right in his tracks. So that was, awesome. uh, that was pretty crazy. And it wasn't, it wasn't a huge deer compared to some of the biggest deer that are sh getting shot here in Wisconsin, but sure. it was a 127. But for me, that was the biggest buck and still is the biggest buck I've shot. That's um, there, that, There's nothing to complain about, about, I mean, 127 is a big deer I mean, that's a big buck. Oh at least yeah. To me, that's a big buck. I mean, that. I don't have anything anywhere close to that. I mean, that's that's a big buck to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a hundred percent satisfied with it. But now it just got that itch going where I'm like, now that I've I've shot two bucks with a bow, uh, I haven't shot a doe with a bow, but I've shot a lot of does with a with a gun. Shot one buck with a gun. Um, now I'm getting a little more patient, and I'm trying to chase after those bigger deer now and kind of enjoy the cat and mouse game that they play with you. Sure change your experience a little bit. And I think everybody kind of goes through that little evolution in different ways where at first it's like trying to get that kill. And now it's like, well, I've done that. Now I want to enjoy more of the experience and that cat and mouse game of that and trying to pattern those big buck that that's a completely different experience. I mean, that's taking it to another level. Yeah. And it's, 
I, I enjoy the challenge, you know, it, a lot of guys can go out there with a gun and shoot a deer. Uh, but for me with the archery thing, it's, you got to get pretty close and personal with those bucks and some of those big bucks. I mean, you make one little snap on a twig and they're, they're gone and out of there and they won't ever run that trail again. So it's, it's definitely hard playing that, but I think that's why I enjoy it the most. Absolutely. I mean, they're that big for a reason. Right. I mean, it's not like they're a two year old deer when they're getting big around here. I mean, they've seen a few seasons now. They've seen probably a few hunters by that point. They're 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 getting older and wiser. I mean, it's just shows you how much better and how much more advanced you have to take the whole entire hunt in your game to try to get on those big bucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And now that I'm doing everything on public land, I kind of straight away from private except for uh gun deer i'll still hunt with my uncle and my grandpa up there and but for for as far as archery goes i'm going to stick to public in wisconsin i mean we have i i can't put an exact number on it but i know it's over like a million acres or something like that here in wisconsin there's a lot of land um i think it's like 33 million acres or something like that it's it's crazy um so i'm gonna keep running that but, I mean, there's some huge bucks I've seen, even duck hunting on public property. And, I mean, they're just monsters. But, like what you were saying, they figured out the people, they figured out the pressure, and they know where to go. Absolutely. And the duck hunting thing brings, like, a brings a different, like, aspect to it as well. Because some of the public land that – I'm lucky enough that I have private land here I can hunt. And because I don't focus on deer hunting, like, what I do find, I let my friends know that – don't have private land or they're big into archery hunting and like different spots I've scouted for duck hunting. I've been like, some of them are kayak hunters. A lot of them are kayak hunters just cause I'm really big into the kayak fishing and hunting thing. But I'd be like, Hey, launch here, come in the backside with your kayak. There's a trail this far off the water. Use the wind. No one can, they, no one can get behind you. Like there's big bucks roaming here. Like, and I'll give them that. Cause there's just, you just see a different view when you're out in the water duck hunting and you're approaching from an angle that deer aren't used to being attacked from basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll run like they'll run creeks and lake edges and it's like, it's almost like a safety barrier for them, you know, cause they're like, they don't, they don't never have any threats that are usually coming from water. So right. it's, I mean, I even snuck up when me and my brother, we were archery hunting this, uh, that public land I shot that buck out of, we took a canoe into it actually. And we didn't have arrows, knock, nothing, just bows laying in the bottom of the canoe. We're just paddling. And all of a sudden this 10 pointer stands up five, 10 yards from the little Creek that we're paddling in on. And, you know, we're fumbling around trying to get a bow and he's just sitting there staring at us. And we were, there's no idea what you are at yeah, that we, point. <laughs> we had a good wind and he was, you know, that buck just never even seen it. So he was just sitting there trying to figure out what we were. Well, we just looked like a bunch of fools fumbling around in the canoe trying to get a bowl, and then the thing finally found it off. But yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you they'll bed and they'll cruise right along that water edge, and they don't have any threats coming from there usually. It's a completely different way to look at hunting, that's for sure. And it's something I look at for if, if I go back to public land hunting, I will definitely act utilize water access far more than I ever did in the past, just because you don't have to worry about scent intrusion. You don't have to worry about making a ton of noise. You can get in so much quieter if you paddle in. I mean, there's just so many different advantages as long as the properties that you're hunting have good water access. I mean, if there's no water, you can't use this technique, obviously. But if you've got a property that sits like backside of a marsh or a river and you can get into areas deeper, quieter, it's just a big advantage. Oh, yeah, I would agree. So how do you so I got so this this has me curious. How do you balance the bow hunting with duck hunting? Like, how do, how do you balance that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a tricky game. That's for sure. sure. Every year I always tell myself I'm going to give myself more time to bow hunt. Um, to chase more deer. And I always end up duck hunting more than I end up bow hunting. But um, it's a hard balance. I'm, I'm a really big early season bow hunter. I mean, that's when I ended up harvesting that buck I shot two years ago was just the end of September. Um, and I've had really good luck with patterning bucks really, really early in the season. And from everything I've experienced and seen throughout public land, there's not too many guys that hunt um, 
not only it's it's hot, it's muggy out, there's mosquitoes everywhere. Not a lot of guys like dealing with it. And some guys just sure. wait to the rut. You know, they're like, oh, you just shoot big bucks during the rut. Which, I mean, is true. There's a lot of people that are shooting monster bucks during the rut. But in my experiences, you can really get on those big bucks early season before you got all these guys tromping through the woods, carrying their stands through, dragging scent halfway across all the public land. So that's – I wouldn't say it's my favorite time to hunt, but for bow season – I think it's the gives me the most opportunities. Sure, makes sense. The deer's there's less pressure on the deer too because like there's just less people hunting, so there's less pressure. They're easier to pattern because their patterns aren't being changed by random hunting pressure. Yeah. So no, that makes sense. So I get it. Like that's how you balance it. You just try to tag out early enough so you have a whole duck season in front of you. Yeah, I mean you kind of get. If you skip the northern opener that we have here in Wisconsin, you get roughly two weeks before the southern zone for waterfall opens. So I'll do like early teal and early goose until bow season opens. And then I'll hunt that for two weeks and then I'll transition into duck hunting. But I think this year, uh, even if I don't take out early, I'll still probably give more time to archery hunting. I really want to start chasing a big buck again. It's it's just something that you don't get from duck hunting. Sure. Even though I, I enjoy duck hunting, I enjoy goose hunting. But I uh, I think it's this year for me to start chasing big bucks again. It's a different it's a different game. It really is. I mean, there's a I love duck hunting. Um, I love the camaraderie. I love having other people in the blind with me. I love mentoring new hunters. That's one thing I really enjoy a lot is mentoring new hunters. Um, and it's fun. I mean, it's a lot of work. And it's probably the most work I do all year is setting decoys, pulling decoys, waist deep in mud, everything else that goes with it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just fun. But I would agree. I mean, I, I love watching a good flock of mallards cupped up coming into the decoys, be like, yeah, I got them. Like, this is like, this is it. I love that. But I wouldn't like, it doesn't have the same adrenaline rush, like as a deer for me. I, I completely understand like that. Like after a good flock of ducks come in, I'm not shaking. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you got a big buck come in, you let an arrow fly, or even you're in gun deer, you get a big buck walk through. Or I even so get excited when I shoot a doe. What am I talking about? Like, like, yeah. I, like I go out for the doe only hunt because we eat a lot of venison here. I mean, one deer won't last us an entire season because we eat a lot of venison. Like we don't buy ground beef anymore. We try to eat only ground venison, stuff like that. Anyways, um, I'm shaking afterwards. Like after I pull that trigger, like for deer hunting i'm shaking like it's a completely different adrenaline rush than duck hunting but oh yeah there's, there's just something about that it's some early mornings on the marsh and the marsh like the ducks starting to fly and everything wakes up there's something about it that just keeps drawing me back to it yeah i love it and i don't know people call me crazy but i love the i love the way a marsh smells you know i for me it's like the muckier the better and in my experience is i a lot of a lot of clean marshes, you know, something that's real cookie cutter and you type in marsh on Google and the first images that show up are, are that marsh, you know, for me, I don't shoot a lot of ducks in places like that. You know, it's where stuff's all gnarly looking and just overgrown water all over the place, mud everywhere, waist deep in muck. Just those are the places that I really get into the ducks. And sure. a lot of guys don't like tromping through that stuff. And I mean, that's fine with me. I'll, I'll do it. You can save the fields for me and I'll, I'll get back there. No, I mean, I think part of that too is like you said, I mean, with all types of hunting, the more, the more effort you put in, the farther back you're willing to go, the harder you scout normally all pays out in the end. And if people aren't willing to get back to where those ducks are, there's less pressure there. So when they do get shot up, they're like, it turns into a safe haven for them. So the less people there, everything else, it all just kind of compounds into making it a far better hunt, even though it takes a lot more work to get there, but it's that work that keeps people out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of adding to that is, you know, there's, there's always going to be other guys hunting and eventually someone will figure out the spots that you're pushing into. And I mean, they'll, they'll either hear you out shooting and, you know, wonder like, Oh, you know, like we're, where are those guys? And they'll start going on Onyx maps, looking at like, oh, there's a pond back there. Or there's a creek running through here. Or people eventually will figure it out. But I always uh, I always try to play the pressure. 
You know, sure. so like opening day, you got a good chance almost everywhere you go. You know, the ducks haven't been shot at yet. They're used to flying around these marshes and almost every every spot you go that's got a good amount of ducks, you'll you'll not necessarily limit, but as long as you're doing decent, I think you'll have a good day. But then after that, you know, these guys, I'd say 75% of the guys I see, they'll hunt the same slew or the same marsh all year long, whether there's ducks there or not. They'll just keep shooting it. And they're like, oh, well, two years ago on that Thursday, I we shot a three-man. And it's like, okay, like, that's – I don't disagree. Like, that marsh right. can be good. But I, I always play off of the pressure, and I try to stay one step ahead of the pressure. And it's like if there's guys – that are hunting these marshes and going into these sloughs, I know the ducks, they're going to go over here or they're going to go to the south end of the marsh or, or they'll fly over the trees into this creek or something and try to get away from the guys. So I always try to play the pressure when it comes to public land duck hunting. And that makes sense. I mean, that's a huge factor with it. It's trying to, it's a lot of scouting too. I don't think, I think a lot of people stop scouting throughout the season as well. Because I think they get into those routines where there should be, if there's ducks here, they should be in this marsh. Or I've had ducks here in past previous years, they should come back where something might have changed where they're not there. And they just keep hunting those same reliable places, which aren't really always reliable. Whereas that like mid season scouting really can pay those dividends because you're trying to, like, you, it keeps you on the birds. Oh, yeah, I would 100% agree. And, and there's, I mean, there's people, you know, they're like, oh, I don't have, four hours a night to go scout or whatever it may be. And it's like, you don't necessarily need four hours to scout. I mean, I find, I would say 90% of the spots that I hunt, I either find the birds going to it or see the birds dropping into it. And that's got to be the last half hour of light is usually right. when you figure that stuff out. Cause I'll either see the birds coming out of a spot out of some, flooded dogwoods or dumping into a hole way back where I didn't see it during the day and, or you can't see over the cattails. And then all of a sudden you just see these birds start pouring in over there and you go on Google maps and you're like, Oh, you know, this, this could have some water in it. You know, the water levels up. I might not be able to take the boat back in there or take a canoe, but it's public and I can tromp through the cattails. And sure enough, you know, you tromp a couple hundred yards and there she is, you know, there's a pond and ducks come pouring out and, that's just where they've been hiding. Right. Right. I mean, and you, and you hit it on the head right there. I mean, it's really only when I'm out scouting, I'll, I only go, I go to one specific spot pretty much. And I kind of sit there for sunset to see where the ducks are either coming from or going to, like, if I think there's ducks in this area, I'll watch to see where they get up and go to know which way they're coming or where they were, or if they're coming back to where I thought they would be, if that's the roost. I won't try to, I won't spend three, like you said, four hours driving around unless if it's early season goose hunting and I'm trying to find fields that they're in, like cut fields, that's slightly different. But for yeah. the duck hunting, I mean, I'll just run out after work. Like I'll eat dinner with the wife and everything else. I'll grab the dog. We'll jump, we'll jump in the truck and we'll be like, all right, let's go check this marsh. And I'll just sit there and I'll hang out for those 30 or 40 minutes while the sun sets with binoculars and just sit there and watch and see which way the ducks are moving. And there's plenty of times I go to a marsh and I'm like, I don't see a duck. So then the next night I go to a different marsh or a different, I mean, but I'm only out that 40 minutes or an hour. I'm not out like four or five, like spending a whole day scouting. Cause I agree. I feel like that's pretty unproductive most of the time. Yeah. And you know, there's, it's hard because you'll, you'll go to spots and then, you know, you want to stay out that late or whatever to watch it. And sometimes, you know, it's sunny out and, Sometimes you can see those birds cruising the skyline, but mm -hmm. you know, on those days where you got real heavy overcast or it's raining and you know, your binoculars are only good <laughs> for a certain amount of light and then you just can't see and you, then you're like, Oh, I don't know if it's a cloud or flock of ducks or whatever. Right. You, I start playing tricks on you and everything. But yeah, I mean, I would say the majority of the time that last half hour of the light is that gives away a lot of keys. And I also, I see a lot of guys I'll go out and scout marshes. And for instance, last year I was in a boat a couple times and I went out scouting and I think it was, uh, it had to be like a Thursday or Wednesday night. I went out and there was probably 45 minutes of light left. I got there and two boats were coming in and they're like, Oh, you know, there's a couple ducks. Like I didn't really see a whole lot of nothing. And, 
you know, you, you kind of got to take it for granted. It's like, you know, maybe they're telling you there are no ducks here, or maybe they seen a bunch and they just don't want you finding them. So you kind of got to take it salt and find it for yourself. But, you know, I see people leaving marshes. They're saying there ain't no ducks there and I'll go in there. I'll come out at dark and I'm like, well, I just watched 300 ducks pour into the slough, but you guys were driving home already because you didn't want to stay and watch. Right. And we go and hunt it that following weekend or the next day or whatever it may be. And, you know, we usually, we usually do pretty good. Scouting pays dividends. And I think I, I really, truly do believe that unless if you're in some magical private, you have this magical private hole that ducks just absolutely love and if you keep the pressure off they stay there all year long i mean unless you have something yeah. like that i mean you just need to scout uh you can't scouting is like if you want to have successful hunts and i know everyone's de- de- definition of successful is different right like i don't need to go out and shoot limits to have a successful hunt but going out and not seeing any birds while i can still have fun i wouldn't call that a successful hunt anymore I mean, at that point, I didn't do enough scouting. At that point, I did something wrong. So it's that scouting is what, like, at least you know there's birds in the area. Like, it, it just, it makes it worth going to hunt, I guess I would want to say. But it's kind of weird, too, because, like, I don't base my hunt on a limit either. So it's it's this weird balancing act of, I want to make sure I'm hunting where there's birds, because I'm really out there to hunt birds, but I don't base my hunt success off killing birds it's, it's just a weird mental thing i got i don't know <laughs> no and i i would agree to a point i mean you know for at least for me i uh i try to do everything as ethical as i can you know i i try to make the cleanest shots i try to make good shots i try not to shoot ducks that are too far away I try not to shoot a deer that's too far away or quartering too far towards me you know if i if i feel uncomfortable in any way taking a shot i I tend to not take those shots. Um, not saying that I ever haven't because I have, you know, and I've, I've lost ducks and it, it just doesn't sit right with me. You know, I would rather hold off on those, let them make another loop or, you know, maybe they fly away, but you know, it's for me knowing that I didn't just wound an animal and it, now it's just out there suffering or I'm shooting ducks that I shouldn't have shot or whatever it may be. I try to be as ethical as I can with it. Um, and that's when it kind of comes down to, you know, of like, what kind of hunter are you? Are you out there to mm-hmm. just shoot and kill? Or are you out there to actually enjoy the pursuit, enjoy the hunt and enjoy like the, the scenery and the com- camaraderie that you get from duck hunting, you know, and some of the best hunts that I've had, we've shot a couple ducks and it, it, but it was still some of the best hunts that I've had. Absolutely. And that's where I am too. And I think everybody, I think a lot of people get there. I mean, a lot of people start with like wanting to prove themselves that they know what they're doing to get their limits. But I think as that changes, and I know it has for me, it's, it's about the entire experience. Now it's about watching my dog. It's about the marsh waking up. It's that entire, that entire experience is what drives me to continue going. And that's, that's, that's where I get that main enjoyment from is that, that experience and, and like you said, I, I'm probably over cautious to a fault now where I'll let birds circle where people will be like, dude, those were well within range. And I'll be like, eh, they weren't feet down enough yet. Or like they were, they were, com- they weren't committed. Like now I'm to the, like there, I've been at hunts where I'm like, I really want feet. I want them backpedaling. That's the only way I'm pulling it. Like I want them backpedaling and, and they'll circle well within range and slow down. I'll just be like, eh, it's not what I'm looking for today. And yeah. we're I won't do that if I have someone else with me, especially like an, an experienced hunter or something like that. But if I'm with someone else that's like on the same page as me and like we want like either like to get some short video of it. Like I said, I don't do the YouTube thing, but we'll still record stuff here and there or take pictures. I'll bring my good camera with. And if I can get some good photos of, back, of ducks backpedaling and then someone shoot like that to me is like, all right, that's cool. Like that's yeah. cool. Yeah. And I would agree. I mean, it's 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 almost like an art to convince ducks you know i mean you just throw these plastic things out there molded like ducks you know and you're <laughs> there reaching on your crawl and to just persuade an animal into thinking that like this is real is you know it's it's an art and it's something that i tend to enjoy a lot you know and i i used to do the same thing i used to just they'd swing at 30 yards and i would take them or whatever but now it's 
yeah, having that big flock of mallards, all their orange feet down back pedaling, like that's just that'll sit with me forever. I would rather see that than, you know, wound a duck or something. Oh, agreed. I'd rather have one good flock come in feet down back pedaling and like everything like just works like that. than have a limit of pass shooting, even at like an ethical range of 25 or 30 yards, but they never really commit. They just circle. And I'd much rather have one flock fully commit than take a limit of like 25 yard, like circling birds. Yeah. Yeah, it's just an experience that, you know, not a lot of people get to see it. And it's it's cool to be able to do something like that. I've had a couple of really fun ones, too. Like, I really was big into field hunting geese. Not so much anymore. I'm starting to put together another field spread. I kind of got out of it. But I had a couple of those times where, like, you got, like, those three or four to land. And you have another flock coming behind you. And you got, like three or four geese walking through your decoys and you've got birds cupped up coming over the tree line. Like those like that, I can, I still remember that haunt because it was like the first time we got birds to land and we continued to work other birds. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this is like something I've never experienced before. Cause these geese are like 30 yards away walking through our decoys now. And we're like sitting there in the layout blinds and we're still calling. They're not freaking out and like you got this group of like 10 or whatever it was behind them just locked up and committed. I'm like, this is awesome. Like that was when I really got hooked on like field hunting geese. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I want to get better in is is field hunting. You know, I, I really don't do a whole lot of it here in Wisconsin. I kind of primarily stick to water and puddle ducks. But last year I kind of dabbled with it. I actually shot my first mallard in a field last year. Uh, so nice. that was cool for me. but yeah, it, it kind of, you know, ignited something else that I want to start chasing and start getting better at. Cause it's just the challenge, you know, I feel like for the most part, I mean, I'm not perfect and I'm definitely not the best duck hunter, but we do really well when it comes to water, uh, with just figuring out our spreads, how to play ducks. We, we do really well. So now it's something, it's just another challenge I want to take on is to, commit to field hunting and trying to figure that out, whether it's geese or ducks or whatever it may be, just figuring that out and learning a new skill is always, always a plus to me. Field hunting's fun. I don't know what, I don't know what's more work to be honest. They're both a lot of work. They are. I mean, there's, there's plenty, there's one field hunt. I remember where it was just super wet and just muddy and we couldn't drive in the field because it was just too muddy. And we didn't like the farmer probably wouldn't have cared. Like we knew the farmer, we were in really good terms. He wouldn't have cared, but we didn't want to wake him up to get the tractor out to get us out because that's how muddy it was. And there, there's just, we weren't going in there with an enclosed trailer and that stuff. So we humped all of our full body decoys in hundreds of yards into this field. And afterwards I was just spent. <laughs> yeah. Like we, like we had an awesome hunt. It was a great hunt. But afterwards I'm looking at all those decoys and that thought crosses your mind. Like, the farmer can just till them in. I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've definitely, uh, definitely been in those shoes. I think I think every waterfowl hunter has at some point where the it was just so much work, and you're looking at those decoys like, do I make enough money to just replace them? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean some of those some of those full bodies they can get pretty heavy too. Oh yeah that they can and then when you're only carrying four or six at a time and you're trying to set up three or four dozen you're just walking back and forth and back and forth and now i do things a little differently i've got like some carts i can use or i've got some collapsible wagons that work good for certain situations and i've started using decoy sleds also if it's that wet and muddy sleds sometimes will pull halfway decent or in a marsh i use a sled too because it seems to pull halfway decent but I'm trying to not, I'm trying to carry less and work smarter. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I feel that. I've also, like I said, cause I got out of the field hunting. I sold my enclosed trailer. I sold all my full bodies and I've actually made the switch to silhouettes. So I can carry four dozen silhouettes on one shoulder with my back, with my blind and my gun, and my case all at one trip. I mean, you get a couple of, you get four dozen silhouettes out there. I still have some shells and some other things. I mean, you can make a really, really good looking spread for a lot less weight. Yeah. It's funny that you say that because last year was the first year I got into silhouettes. Um, um, 
starting to buy some some silhouettes this year to kind of get my own field spread going. But yeah, I mean, you know, we were dragging those full bodies and we had B2 full bodies. So, I mean, they're not, they're not the lightest thing in the world. So we're dragging those things through field, you know, and my buddy comes up with his five dozen silhouettes and he's just walking like he's going through a park. And I'm like, what are we doing? You know, <laughs> I mean, there's, I wasn't, I wasn't sure on how they would do, you know, because to me, I was like, just like a piece of cardboard that looks like a goose pretty much, you know? Right. Um, then I started to do a little more research on them, see what guys are doing with them. And people are doing phenomenal with silhouettes and it's for the price point and for the convenience of just being able to carry five dozen in a bag and have your blind on your back when you're gone with you and whatever, and not be drenched in sweat by the time you get out to the field. It's right. Just, it just makes complete sense. And it's cool. Like if you set up a big enough spread, I only have four dozen, but I've hunted over 12 at one point, like with other buddies and whatnot that were really big into it. If you see it from an aerial view with a drone, it looks way different than what it does on the ground. It really does. Cause like, as you come over the top, like, as like they disappear and then you can see them again, it almost looks like they're moving. Because yeah, like nice. it's it, it's it's like a two D shape in a three D world. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like they move because like you see some, then you don't, then you see more, and you don't see them, and it's like they're it, it's weird. But I can see why it works when you look at it from up above. Yeah, that was one video I watched on YouTube actually. Um, it was from the dive bomb guys, and sure. I mean they make they make a bunch of decoys and whatnot too. And I I do enjoy their decoys. I I enjoy watching their videos. They're all really well knowledge guys when it comes to pretty much anything waterfall they they do really phenomenal work they make really good gear but yeah that was one thing that they were doing they were flying drones over their spread and kind of explaining on why they make silhouettes why they set stuff up a certain way and that was one point they made was for the geese when they're flying over they'll they'll see them and then they'll disappear and then they'll see them again or they'll swoop around come in at a different angle and it just makes it look like the geese are moving around and it kind of takes their attention away from stuff that's just sitting still, like not a, not as well of a brush blind or whatever it may be, you know, something, something glaring because you left a candy wrapper or something on the edge or whatever it may be. It, it kind of keeps their eyes distracted and kind of helps them commit to the, to the spread. And I've seen, like, I think I've actually seen that. I probably that same dive bond video. And even after watching it, I'm like, yeah that's marketing right like they have everything positioned right they took hundreds yeah. and hundreds of passes to make it look really good so like when we tried it like i was shocked at how like it how similar it actually looked for us just setting them out and like we didn't adjust anything like we just flew the drone around i'm like this actually works like this is real like now i understand like i'm not buying full bodies anymore we'll just run the shell like i run shells now because they're lightweight and you can pack in a dozen shells easy and then i run silhouettes and the shells i feel like just give it a little more a little bit different of a look but i think i run like five dozen silhouettes to a dozen shells is what my setup is right now and I, if i'm going to add i'm probably going to stay right around that same ratio and i don't think i'll buy full bodies again yeah i'm kind of over the full body games i'm sure we'll i'm sure we'll keep some just to kind of break up the the look of the spread and the outlines but yeah i'm i'm pretty much fully committed to silhouettes it's when, once you have success over them as well, it's like, why have I been doing this the other way? Like, especially like if you can't drive into the fields you're going, if you can drive in silhouette, like it doesn't matter at that point. Now you're only, now you're making shorter walks. It's not that big of a deal to set up dozens of full bodies, but when you can't walk in, if the farmer's like, if, if there's like winter wheat planted, or if you're hunting over cut off alpha and he's going to try to cut it again, if it's early season or something crazy like that, like, yeah, like just being able to carry in all the decoys and have a good spread is so worth it. Oh yeah. I would agree. It just makes it way more convenient and it is for everybody, you know, even on, even on cleanup and big crews. I mean, you still got a lot of guys, but you know, it's a lot of work, a lot of decoys and being able to just throw 10 dozen over your shoulders and just walk out. It's, it makes life way easier. I agree. I agree. I'm happy. I made the change. Happy I made the change. No, that's that's actually another change I've been thinking about. Have you seen the? What do you? What are your thoughts on the lifetime decoys for ducks? 
Oh man. <laughs> um, <laughs> now I don't normally talk decoys or anything like this, but I'm curious because we're talking lightweight now. Yeah. I haven't so, made the change, and I know a couple guys that absolutely love them. So I'm curious if you've hunted over them. I've never hunted over them. I know a couple guys that use them. Um, from what, and I, I've, I've seen them. I've felt them. I've carried them. Never hunted over them. Um, for me personally, it just comes down to the financial thing. They are expensive, um, but they are extremely well made. And if I if I didn't have to budget on a waterfall basis of being able to support myself and and all that, uh, if I just had endless money to blow um, on decoys, I would 100% buy lifetime decoys. They're phenomenal decoys and extremely lightweight. Uh, that it's it's the weight that gets it to me like especially like when i'm out in the canoe or, or my kayak like i don't want to be humping around 100 pounds worth of decoys if i don't have to like yeah changing over to the i mean I, it's always in the back of my head i'm like they're so much lighter but there's but there's so much money yeah they are and they were lighter than i thought they were gonna be you know i i seen all the commercials for them and whatnot on youtube and seen the advertisements on instagram and all that but until I actually like had one in my hands and was able to like look over the the artwork on it and be able to feel it, it was yeah, it's it definitely changed the game. But it definitely comes down to a financial standpoint with some people, and I think that's for a lot of people is you know a lot of people don't have one hundred twenty dollars to drop on half a dozen duck decoys. And I, I don't agree. Know that when you got you know you got to depending on how you line them, I run Texas rigs on all my decoys, you know, so that's for roughly for like a 48 inch Texas rig for a dozen is almost 50, 55 bucks. So I mean, and, I, and I've made that decoys and right. It all adds up quick. I mean, I always joke around like, like, cause I mentor people and whatnot. And they're like, and they're after duck hunt, a lot of times like, oh, I really want to get into this. I'm like, careful what you wish for because of all the hunting i do this is hands down the most expensive when it comes to all the stuff you need oh yeah yeah and it's endless on what you can do i mean every year i spend a couple grand on duck hunting and i towards the end of the year i'm like you know i feel good you know i got all this new stuff i got you know i got a lot and then the next season starts coming up and then i start thinking about all those things where i'm like oh you know that would have been nice to have like this would have been nice to have like oh i need this i need this and but it kind of goes with like the more you learn too. I mean, once you start to, cause I feel like everyone starts out with a dozen mallard decoys and right. a couple floaters geese or something like that. And they kind of run off that. And I've shot a lot of ducks over that. I've shot a lot of ducks over half a dozen mallards. Um, but as you progress in hunting and you start to grow and your scouting ventures and stuff too, you start to stumble upon more and more ducks and for me, I try to make it as most realistic as possible. And if I'm hunting three, 400 dogs, I try to have somewhat of a, a good spread out. And it also depends on, you know, like wind and weather and, and all that. But for just being, for, ju for just starting out, you can definitely, definitely put down a lot of ducks with a dozen mallards. Agreed. Agreed. And don't be afraid. Like, don't think you always need a dozen also. I mean, some of the small potholes I've hunted, I've just brought five or six head mail, especially early in the year. I mean, if you've got a small pothole that that works real well, and I've hunted over five or six head mallards. I didn't even put a drake out there. I mean, drakes aren't that pretty that time of year. I mean, more realistic to me was nothing but a handful of hand mallards at that point. I mean, they're all pretty brown. So yeah. and I've had great success over something as simple as that To I've hunted on the Mississippi over dozens and dozens of decoys before and had great success. I really think like you said, you have to kind of tailor it to where you're hunting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me last year, we, uh, we found this marsh and it was holding a lot of ducks, but they kind of like, one week they'd be there another week they wouldn't. And we couldn't really figure out like what was all going on and why they were there. Um, I mean, we, we knew why they were using it, but we couldn't figure out why they would shift through there a lot. And I still never figured it out. Um, but I just 
it was one of those spots, you know, I would, I would just check periodically. And when they were there, we just, we just hit it. Um, and we ran five, five and a half dozen, dozen mallards. We had Higdon pulsators. I think we had four of those, uh, Higdon crazy kicker. And we had a mojo and we absolutely just piss pounded them. Um, nice. Every, Every spread we ever saw in that area was never even close to what we threw. But then right after we did that spread, it never worked again. Um, we ran a spread similar to that like two weeks later, and they didn't want nothing to do with it. Um, so we completely switched our style up. We found ducks in there again, went back in there and ran just over a dozen, but ran a lot more drakes. And I think we only had like three hens. Um, and same thing. They never saw it coming. Sure. Uh, it was still the same amount of numbers, same amount of birds. Um, and it was mainly all mallards. We had some gadwells in there, had some pintails in there, but for the majority of it, it was mallards. Um, so they caught onto our spread and we just switched it up on them. And I believe that some of the ducks that we hunted were still the same ducks we hunted over the first spread. But yeah, I mean, just switching spreads out and playing ducks by ear is definitely something that you got to do throughout the season. I agree. I agree. If you're throwing the, if you have the exact same spread as everybody else out there, like that's something I won't do. I mean, there's been times I've changed my spread. Like if you hunt a bigger marsh, some of the bigger marshes that are run by me, like you can see what other people are hunting over. Like it's, it's not hard, even though you're spread out, you can, you still have an idea of how many ducks they're hunting over. And if everybody around me has a small spread, I'll probably throw a big spread. If everybody around me is running giant spreads, I'll probably tailor my spread way back. If everybody's running mojos, I won't. Like I yeah. kind of like try to do opposite of what other people around me are doing because I don't want to. If they see the same thing, if they're flying overhead and they've seen the same spread, like basically the same spread, almost the same spread again. Like I don't want to just be one of those other spreads out there. I want to look different. I want to try to look more realistic and every duck spread on the water isn't, doesn't look the same. And if everybody's out there looks the same, they're going to kind of think like something ain't right here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of goes back to what I was saying when it comes to the scouting is like hunting. The pressure is, is looking at and observing what everybody else is doing and making your decisions built off of that. You know, I mean, nothing's for sure. Um, but if you can, if you can line up as much stuff as you can and be like, you know, I check this box, like this is where the ducks were yesterday. Like, everybody's hunting over a dozen mallards and two mojos you know you check that so you're like all right not running running a dozen mallards and two mojos or you know they're they're all hail calling or whatever they're doing um if you can just try to do the opposite of what people are doing and like what you said just make it as realistic as possible i, I feel like that definitely helps you out definitely in pressured properties that's for sure I agree. And it's, it's ever like, it's harder to get away from the pressure. At least I think so. Like, I feel like it's getting harder to get away from the pressure. I don't know if there's more hunters out there. I don't know if ducks are just concentrating in different areas, which are easier to access, but I feel like I'm hunting far more pressured areas now than I ever used to. Yeah. And I would say with like, it's kind of a little bit of everything. I mean, definitely with social media and stuff, it's, you know, a lot of guys can go on YouTube and watch videos about duck hunting or goose hunting or deer hunting or pheasant hunting, whatever it may be. And something could spark their interest. And they're like, you know, I want to, I want to go try that. Not saying that people shouldn't continue to hunt and there shouldn't be new hunters, but it's just a challenge that we got to adapt to is learning how to hunt with more pressure. And where I'm located in Wisconsin, which is like Southern East Wisconsin, there is a lot of pressure. Um, but I, I, I also enjoy the pressure because there's, a couple hunts one specifically i went on three years ago uh we actually hunted out of a boat and i'm not big out of hunting out of boats um but we also couldn't touch the bottom so we didn't really have a choice <laughs> didn't feel like sitting there treading water and holding the shotgun <laughs> all the time. Um, and i scouted the spot the night before saw a couple boats up in there um decent sized marsh and I found the exact hole where they wanted to be. And it was just this flooded grass patch and a lot of cover, a lot of food. And not too many people were going through that section. Um, but it was also like 
you know, a lot of guys will check like the edges of marshes or whatever. And it was right in the middle of this marsh. Um, and we were the first ones out there the following day. And I had three boats come past me, two boats stopped shy of me and another one way farther in the marsh. And for the first half hour of shooting light, we knocked down, it was just me and another guy. We knocked down 10 birds and nobody else shot that whole first half hour. And we consistently went, kept, going back to the regulations we're like you know we're, we checked four or five times that it was open because we we're like you know there's ducks flying everywhere and they're just piling into this hole that we're in but nobody else was shooting um and when we got back to the launch we were the first people back to launch we had two boats come back and they're like yeah you know we we shot one duck or you know we saw four ducks and it's like well we we had a couple hundred come in right the first half 45 minutes of the and we were done and you know then they're like oh where'd you go and blah 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 and it's like well we were hunting the same marsh i'm like you just you just weren't in the right hole but i'm like they were there and then sure enough those people that i told that we hunted you know they ended up finding the hole that we hunted and that following weekend um i was out there scouting and they were out there in the afternoon hunting it. um you know a lot of people get upset when they see other guys in there in their holes or whatever it may be. But it's, to me, it's, you know, I, I already shot the birds that were using that. So go ahead and hunt it. Like, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's public land. You right. have just the right to be there as I do. I found the birds before you, I hunted them before you, you know, and, the, and they just could have well found the birds before me and hunted it before me. But I scouted harder. I found the birds first. I got on them first. And that's just kind of how it goes when it comes to, pressured birds is just you got to be faster and smarter than everyone else right and you can't i mean you go out and hunt a spot you're i mean you're putting all your chips on the table i mean there's one spot that i found that i'm gonna hunt next year that a lot of people think you can't legally hunt but you can like i really dug a lot of deep research into it and it's a very unique situation but nobody hunts that and throughout the year like towards the end of the year it turns into this little sanctuary because everybody thinks you can't hunt it. And I spent hours, I made multiple phone calls, everything about it. It looks very deceiving, but it is legal. Yeah. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to be patient. Wait until all those birds. Cause I mean, last year, that's just where they wanted to be and wanted to be. And I, and I, once I do it once though, I mean, the, the word's out. Like it, it's like, yeah, it's I'm going to have to wake, I'm going to have to wake up earlier than the next guy. I'm going to have to get there first. And, after a hunt or two, I mean, it's no longer going to be that bird sanctuary. It's going to be like the rest of the marsh, high, high pressure. But I'm going to pay play my cards right. I'm going to wait till we got a good amount of birds in here, and I'm going to go hunt it. And it's going to be phenomenal. And we're going to get back to the ramp, and everybody's going to be like, you can't hunt that. And I'll be like, look at it for yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that goes back to it, too. You know, is, is, I feel like some guys just don't do enough research on certain properties. And there, there are it does get confusing. I mean, there's freaking – boundary lines all over the place oh, yeah. you hunt if you hunt by a wild refuge there's refuge signs everywhere you, it does get confusing um but in my experience most dnr wardens will either help explain it to you i've had dnr wardens actually come out and you know verify what i'm doing and you know like show them on my phone like hey this is like where i'm planning on going like just want to double check and I think before you do anything, if you are seriously questioning a spot, if you can hunt it or not, is definitely talking with your nearest game warden and just trying to figure that out. Um, Absolutely. The last thing you want to do is be caught red-handed for something that you shouldn't be doing. Even though you think you're perfectly fine in there, it's always better to just double check, make sure you're legal. Um, and it's just more enjoyable then. I agree 100%. I mean, I already talked to the warden about this. I talked to the county sheriff's department about it. I mean, I made multiple phone calls to confirm what I was looking at. So I agree. Like if it's not cut and dry, like if it's kind of questionable, you really got to do that extra step of research and make those phone calls. Cause not only that, cause once you've made these phone calls, if people truly do think it's not legal, someone's going to probably call you in. I mean, it's yeah. going to happen. So there's only a couple of wardens per County. I mean, now granted, if they call the sheriff's department, You'd have to make sure they talk to the right cop, but that's a little different. But I mean, if you've done all your research, odds are when that phone call gets made, they'll be like, he already checked with me. That is actually legal. 
Yeah, it's that's funny because <laughs> I I found a spot similar to that last year actually, um, and I stared at it on a map for a while, and I was looking at all boundary lines, and I was like, I don't see how you couldn't hunt it, um, and it definitely does not look like you can hunt it, um, and I I got super confused, and I just started to frustrate myself over it. And I ended up talking to a game warden and the first game warden I actually talked to said I couldn't hunt it. Um, and my buddy called me crazy because I started arguing with him. And I was like, you know, I was being super polite. I wasn't being rude or anything like that. But I was like, I've done all the research on it, checked boundary lines, like walked out there. I did everything I possibly could do. And I was like, no, you legally can hunt this. I'm like, you have to. I was like, I just, I know you can. Um, so he actually had me send him a pin of the spot I wanted to hunt. I sent him a printout of like the map overlays and the boundary lines. Um, and it was by a refuge. And he actually talked to the boundary guy who deals with all like the boundary lines and all that. And he actually came back and told him that I was correct. Um, so the warden called me back and he's like, Hey, uh, yeah, you can hunt that area. He's like, I apologize for, he's like saying what I did. And he's like, I just didn't know. Um, but he's like, I checked with everybody and he's like, you can, you can hunt it legally. Um, he's like, just make sure you got your gun in your case when you're walking and all sure. that kind of gave me a rundown on what you should do. And, um, I was never, I was never yelling at him or like that type right. of argument, but I was sternly saying, Hey, like I disagree with what you're saying. I've done all the research on it. Um, and same thing is I was like, I was like, Hey, uh, I was like, hopefully we don't get called in. And he's like, well, he's like, if you get called in, he's like, I'll be the one the phone call that gets answered by. So he's like, <laughs> you don't got to worry about it. <laughs> but then once you hunt that, if anybody notices it, that thought it was off limits. I mean, you throw all your, like all your chips are on the table. Like it's open for everyone now. I mean, it's, it's, oh yeah. I mean, it's awesome. Like you have to tie, like when you find these places and, there, and there's a lot of them out there, there's a lot of places like this out there where you, you do the research and you're like, you really can hunt this. Once you, I mean, you got to like, you got to time it right. Like you got to make sure there's birds in the area. Like that's not just something you just jump into on a hope and a prayer. Like that's something you scout, you save, you make sure the birds are there. Cause once you hunt that once, like everybody's going to know about it. Oh yeah. Secret gets out fast. Oh yeah. Sure. Well, we did, I mean, let's talk, we I mean, we can touch base quick on your YouTube channel. I know you got a small YouTube channel. You're getting off the ground. How's that going for you? Um, it's funny. So last year, uh, I, I've thought about it for years. You know, I've watched like Dan Infall. I've watched the hunting public. I've watched some of the dive bomb guys and I've always been interested in it. Um, and I always told myself, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to start record my hunts. And then, you know, hunting season would go by and I'm like, oh, like, I, I just didn't do it. Like, I don't know why. And I just kind of kept making excuses for myself. And then last year I was like, you know what, I'm going to just, I'm going to just do it. I had a cheap little canon t6 dslr camera i bought a gopro um and this was all new to me i've never done any sort of filmmaking any sort of like photography <laughs> really i always enjoyed like having good photos um sure just of like pile pics and taking a photo of a deer and all that like i always just enjoyed having those photos to look back on for the memories um and i think that's why i kind of got into the youtube thing is you know, being able to go back and actually rewatch the hunt, I can almost relive it in a sense. Um, now, the videos that I came out with last year, they're terrible for <laughs> for what I could do. I mean, it's. But you got to uh, start somewhere. I mean, yeah, that's the only way to start. It, but I, I enjoyed it. And that that's why I liked it. Um, it. It's still memorable to me is being able to go back. And, you know, no one's just a professional the first time they start trying to do videography and all that i had no idea what i was doing i watched countless youtube videos trying to figure stuff out and i mean it's definitely getting better um i've upgraded camera equipment i started to get into it more i start practicing a lot more i actually went out quite a bit this year um like over the winter and i was just practicing editing videos practice making videos practice talking in front of a camera Sure. all that and all that stuff pays off um but yeah it's i'm excited for this year i actually got a, a turkey hunt coming up this weekend actually that nice. I'll be filming, and then i'll be filming my buddy's turkey hunt the following weekend but yeah i just really enjoyed it 
Um, and now it's becoming more of a passion. It's not only, not only can I enjoy the passion of hunting, but now I can kind of like freeze those memories and time for people by making the videos. They can always come back and look at it. And it's, it's getting difficult between like, do I want to pick up the shotgun or do I want to pick up the camera? Um, right. You know, and I've, I've shot a lot of ducks. Um, I enjoy it. I'll still duck hunt, still deer hunt. Um, but I am going to dive more into the YouTube game this year. So I'm pretty excited for that. I got some good buddies that are into photography and videography so that we're going to kind of all work together and kind of push that out. Um, but yeah, I'm going to just keep practicing, keep getting at it, see, see what I can create. And I want to be inf informational for everybody. I don't want it to be just like you go on YouTube and you see some of these hunt videos and it's like, Oh, I add for this, add for this, add for this, you know, it's, I don't want nothing to do with that. I want people to be able to either get entertainment out of it or information out of it. Sure. Um, and for me, being able to share that to somebody else and show other people an experience that I enjoy and show my passion is something that, you know, I, I really enjoy it. And I just want to want to keep sharing those experiences with people. I get that 100%. That's why I mentor. I mean, that's a big reason why I mentor first time hunters. I mentor, I work with different nonprofits for veterans and first responders. I take kids out hunting. I mean, that's a big reason I do that. I'll give you credit. Like I have no patience for fit, for editing video. I just can't, I sit in front of a computer all day long for work. I cannot sit in a computer and just edit videos. Like it takes me, it takes me enough of my mental like aptitude just to be like, all right, I got to sit down and try to edit this like 30 second reel. Yeah. <laughs> like doing five or 10 minute YouTube videos. There's just no way. Yeah, give you all the credit in the world, man. It's definitely a challenge, but I'm um, I'm definitely getting way better at it. I mean, the first video I ever did was off a DSLR and a GoPro, um, and some of the footage is all right. Most of it's crap um, compared to what I want to be doing in the future, sure, and what I'm kind of working for. But I also enjoyed figuring it out. Um, it's a challenge, and to be able to take something and just kind of like make it into something you just go back and rewatch and relive that's just so intriguing to me so being able to to get better at that and be able to like tell a story through the videos is something that i'm working on and definitely getting better with and i'm hoping that this year is a, a big step in the right direction i got better equipment I've got some people that are definitely willing to help out and understand what's all going on and where I want to go with things. Um, so I'm excited for it. I'm excited to be able to share it with everybody else. And I hope people can get some sort of entertainment or some sort of information out from it. That's awesome, man. On that note, why don't, why don't you take the next couple of minutes, let everybody know where they can find your YouTube channel, Instagram. If you got a Facebook page, Twitter, not, I don't know who's got Twitter, but I always offer it out there. So <laughs> I never had a Twitter. I, I don't know if I ever will. Um, but no, yeah. So on YouTube, it's just Quacks and Quivers Outdoors. Um, same with our website, just Quacks and Quivers Outdoors.com. I actually just started coming out with apparel. I actually got one of the hats on right now. Um, I like I it. I, lo I like the old school camel, man. I'm a, yeah, I'm a fan of the old school trucker hat. Yeah. I love it. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not for everybody, but you know, you have the option. You're not for that. That's the best part. Um, but yeah, I love the old school camel. I love the old school look. That's just something I, I wanted to have on the website. Um, but yeah, I just got hoodies, some hats coming out. Um, got some t-shirts coming out for summer. Uh, and then Instagram is just quacks and quivers outdoors as well. But yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, it's interesting being on social media and the people you meet just all enjoying the same thing that you're out chasing. It's, it's cool to have that like link between everybody. I agree. It's, it's amazing how big the community is, but how small it can feel like for all, I mean, I can't, there's only a handful of times I've messaged someone and, and I blind message people all the time. I, I didn't really know you. I'm like, Hey, come on the podcast. Like they took me a long time to get out of my comfort zone to like do that, to like find guests even. Cause I never really had planned on doing a podcast. It just kind of happened. Like it just kind of appeared to be honest, but um, like it's, a, it's blown my mind how receptive and friendly, like people really are in the community. And I'm the same way. I'll have people message me. Hey, 
how do you have this set up? Or how did you do this with your kayak? Or how do you like, how do you do this on your boat? And I'm like, Oh, Hey man, it's just like this here. Like, or I'll have someone be like, Oh, I saw you got that new dot, that new light from like Southern light LEDs. Like, was it really worth it? I'm like, yeah, it really was. Like, I'm not going to lie about it. Like it was what money well spent. Like the difference is night and day. It really is. But like, I'll be a hundred percent honest. Or if someone will message me and be like, Hey, what do you think of this piece of equipment? I saw you using? I'll be like, it's trash. I'd never buy it. I won't say it publicly, but I'll tell you personally, I'd never buy it. So, yeah. I mean, it's just amazing how friendly and like forthcoming a lot of people are. If you ask the right questions, if you ask like about gear or setups or like techniques, if you start asking like, Hey, where should I go hunt? That's not going to come across in the right light. But if you ask the right questions, I'm like trying to gain knowledge of, Hey, like, this is how I'm going to set up my, my hunt. What do you think? Or, this is the setup I think I'm going to use for my kayak. Do you see any problem? Like all of that stuff, all those questions. I've always been like, absolutely. Like here, do this, try this, do, do it this way. Oh, you like my setup? Here's links to everything I've installed on my kayak. Like, I don't care. You can make the exact copy of mine. It doesn't bother me one bit. Like go for it. Yeah. And I, I would, I would definitely agree to that. It's, it's fun to be able to share that stuff, you know, cause everyone, everyone starts from something, you know, I mean, even the, greatest deer hunters, greatest duck hunters, like nobody had a $40,000 duck boat, you know, and right. We don't start out with that. So it's, it's cool to be able to share those experiences and help, help new people kind of get a, get ahead of the game a little more than just trying to guess for themselves. So that a lot of it, you got to learn yourself, but you know, being able to, to help and reach out is, is definitely the part of social media that I enjoy. I agree, man. I agree 100%. Well, I will drop links to all of your stuff in the comments for the show so everybody can check out your YouTube channel and watch it grow. I think it's going to be great. I'll keep an eye on it. I think I already subscribed. If I didn't, I will. Um, look forward to next season, man. I hope you have a great duck season. I hope you are able to chase them bucks and like really get a good pattern on one and really enjoy that experience. I think that's really cool. I'm ho I, I hope you video it. I hope you video it. I'll be, I'll be interesting to watch with you. Oh, it'll be there. It'll be there. That'll be awesome. Like That'll said, be awesome. I got a turkey hunt coming up this weekend, so that'll be uh, that'll be going up here soon. Awesome, yeah! I look forward to the future for you, man. I think it'll be cool. Um, all my listeners, thanks again for tuning in, and until next time, keep chasing that experience. Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode here on Paddle and Finn. Be sure to drop a five star rating, a thumbs up, or smash that subscribe button on any platform you're listening in on. Be sure to check us out on Waypoint TV, waypointtv.com. Make sure you sign up for the Fantasy Kayak Fishing League at paddleandfin.com forward slash fantasy. You could support this show through Patreon, patreon.com forward slash paddleandfin. Don't forget to check out the website paddleandfin.com. Catch us on YouTube. If you got a question, comment, or want to see a future guest on the show, be sure to email us at paddleandfin at gmail.com. Shout out to our show supporters, Yak Gadget. You can check out all the fine kayak accessories at yakgadget.com. Pelican Professional. For all your cases, coolers, and lighting needs, go to pelican.com. Rocktown Adventures. Your Midwest premier paddle sports destination. Go to rocktownadventures.com. Eastport Marina, the beautiful destination on Dale Hollow Lake. If you're looking for lodging, kayaks, kayak accessories, or anything fishing related on the beautiful Dale Hollow Lake, go to eastport.info. Jig Masters Jigs. When in doubt, get the jig out. Go to jigmasters.com and fill your tackle boxes today.